Hello everyone. So I've got another award-winning recipe to share with you today. So if you like American pale ales, which lean into the more traditional flavor profile of what many would call the West Coast style pale ale nowadays, then stick around and I'll give you the full breakdown. So the beer we're looking at today picked up a silver in the 2024 Scottish National, scoring 41 out of 50. My thinking with this recipe was to try and blend kind of traditional American sea hops in the boil with some more modern tropical fruit forward hops later on in the whirlpool and dry hop. I wanted a crisp, clean beer that still had that classic resiny citrus flavour and some firm bitterness but showcasing some of the brighter tropical notes that you can get from more modern varieties. I didn't actually get any brewing footage for this beer, so this video is gonna focus on geeking out really on the recipe details and what I think made this a good example of the style, particularly for uh, competition purposes. So if you do find this content useful, please remember to hit the like button, subscribe, drop a comment in, and you can also directly support the channel by hitting the thanks button or clicking on some of the affiliate links in the description below. Let's start with an overview of the numbers for this recipe. So you might notice that the gravity and color are a little bit on the low side when you compare them to the style guidelines. But to be honest, as long as the ABV and the bitterness are in the ballpark, I'm not too fussed about how we get there. So the predicted numbers were an OG of 1044, an FG of 1008, giving an ABV of 4.7% predicted, an EBC color rating of 6.9, IBUs at 4.6, which gives a BUGU of just over one. And this is all for a 23 liter batch at 78% brew house efficiency. You can see the full recipe in the link uh, for Brew Father in the description if you want to go through that. The bitterness is towards the top end of the style guidelines, but do bear in mind that nearly a third of those IBUs are calculated from the Whirlpool editions. And in my experience, the perceived bitterness that you get out at the end doesn't necessarily translate to the number that you end up with, particularly when you're adding quite a lot of high alpha hops into your whirlpool. We are also aiming to satisfy the style descriptors for an American pale ale with this recipe, which quote moderate to high bitterness. So don't be afraid to push the IBUs up a little bit with your recipes for APAs if you're entering them into competitions. This isn't going to be a hazy pale ale. It should have firm bitterness. It's not gonna be soft and juicy and um, all the kind of things that we see with the more modern interpretations of pale ales that are available uh, commercially in a lot of cases. So the grist consisted of 70% low color Maris Otter, 19% extra pale golden promise, 7% Munich malt and 4% carapils. In this case, it was actually dextrin malt, but that's essentially an equivalent of carapils. I would love to say that the blend of those two base malts was some kind of magic formula, but in reality, I only had three kilos of the extra pale Maris, so I was just making up the difference with some of the extra pale Golden Promise. I'm pretty sure either variety could be used on its own without making much difference. I've used the little bit of Munich and Carapils in this recipe just to add a little bit of sweetness and body to the grist, which should maintain a fairly light malt character compared to if you add in maybe some darker kind of caramel or crystal malts. And that's really gonna help the hops to kind of take center stage uh, with this beer. So these were mashed at 65 degrees to give a nice fermentable work, which will hopefully help the yeast to attenuate and give us a nice crisp and dry finish on the beer at the end. For the water profile, as per usual, I started off with straight RO water and then added enough gypsum and calcium chloride to give the water profile that you can see on the screen. So basically a three to one uh, sulfate to chloride ratio, which is kind of my go-to for pale ales like this. And again, that should help with the kind of crisp dry finish and also to push the balance a little bit more towards the hot bitterness uh, with this. For the hops, the majority of the hot side additions were Centennial and Chinook. 
So two classic American sea hops there, which will always work really well in kind of American pale ales and IPAs like this, particularly if you are looking for more of that kind of West Coast flavor profile. So Centennial is a variety that I really love on its own, but I've also found that it plays really well with a wide range of other hops. It's one of the kind of original American sea hops and is often referred to as Super Cascade, although you do find that the kind of grapefruit flavor on Centennial is a bit less intense than what you get with Cascade. And for me, gives a few more kind of subtle floral notes, as well as some of that kind of classic resiny, piney kind of American hop flavor as well. One of the reasons this variety works really well with other hops, particularly through the boil, is due to the amount of survivable compounds that are within it. If you haven't seen the research by Yakima Chief into survivables, that's well worth a look, and I will put a link to that in the description. You can see a little chart of the survivables and different hops on the screen at the moment. Uh, and you can see there that Centennial is right up at the top of the chart in terms of the amount of survival compounds that it contains. Uh, in summary, basically what that means is that there's gonna be much more of those flavor and aroma compounds left after the boil from Centennial than you will get with a lot of other hops. So this makes it a particularly effective hot side addition. Chinook brings even more sticky kind of piney resin notes to the table and some citrus flavors as well. It can have a bit of a spiky bitterness to it. So it's quite a potent hop and it can be a bit divisive. Not everyone likes Chinook that much, but again, I think that it is a hop that can work really well in combination and it can provide a nice counterpoint to some of the more kind of tropical or bright fruit flavored uh, kind of hops that we are seeing nowadays. Uh, it's just going to bring some of that more traditional kind of American hop flavor uh, into your beer as well. One thing I would say with Chinook though is that I'm not a massive fan of using it in the dry hop as the kind of pine flavor for me that it gives when you apply it at that stage can become a little bit overwhelming in the beer. So most of the Whirlpool is made up of Strata and Nelson. Uh, to me, Strata can really complement those American sea hops quite well. It's got some really nice kind of dank citrus, some people would say weedy kind of uh, flavor in there, as well as some more bright kind of tropical notes as well. It's a relatively new variety that was released by Indie Hops in 2018. And you've probably seen it if you're into craft beers already in lots of commercial beers. It's proving quite popular with a lot of craft breweries and you can kind of see why when you look at the numbers for Strata in terms of the oil content, which is very high, and the essential oils as well. You can watch a really interesting film that I found about the creation of Strata hops uh, on one of the links in the description. Uh, that's from Indie Hops themselves, so go and check that out. That's well worth a watch. And finally, the Nelson. So this is one of my kind of all-time favorite hops as far as something to put into the Whirlpool and Dry Hop. It's all about those big, kind of juicy, zesty, grape and gooseberry notes that it brings to the table, a little bit of that classic kind of New Zealand lime kind of hop flavor as well. And I just think it, it works really nicely in these kind of beers as a little bit of a counterpoint to the more traditional kind of American hop flavors. Uh, and I've tried it in lots of uh, commercial beers, particularly by Burnt Mill Brewery, who I highly recommend if you haven't tried their beers before, but they have used uh, quite a lot of Nelson, particularly in kind of West Coast style IPAs that they've made and I've always found those to be really good. So even though I haven't tried this particular combo out myself, I think there is some precedent there uh, for it working pretty well. So just as an overview, you can see this is quite a well hopped beer with uh, 200 grams of hops in total, uh, but the dry hop rate is fairly modest by today's standards. So we're only looking at around four grams per litre. I think that's quite important if you're trying to meet the kind of competition or BJCP style guidelines for an APA because we want there to be some kind of balance between the malt and the hops. The hops should still be dominant, but uh, it shouldn't be, you know, hazy hop soup like you're seeing in a lot of the kind of current interpretations of pale ales. Uh, so particularly for competition entries, I think you want to kind of keep uh, the dry hopping maybe toned down a little bit compared to what you might see in a lot of 
uh, craft beers currently. Going the other way, you could of course brew an APA without any dry hop at all. There are classic commercial recipe examples uh, of that, but you may find it difficult to impart the level of kind of hop aroma into the beer uh, that is required again by, by the guidelines for that. So just to mention the process for the whirlpool and dry hop. So for whirlpooling, I cooled the wort down to 80 degrees C before adding the whirlpool hops and then kept them in the whirlpool for 30 minutes before cooling to the pitching temperature. And with the dry hops, after the beer had finished fermenting, I'd cooled it down to 14 degrees C, added the dry hops for two days, then crash cooled as close to freezing as I could get it, probably for one to two days longer, and then transferring into the keg once the hops had dropped out. For the yeast, I've used Laumon Bry 97. I find that this is a really good choice for these kinds of beers where you want sort of good attenuation, uh, good flocculation, and it really does kind of get out the way uh, in terms of the flavor profile. So it's a very clean yeast. It will let the hops uh, really shine through and yeah, basically just does a good job of giving a nice clean finish on the beer. I fermented it at the lower end of the temperature range uh, under five PSI of pressure just to give it a helping hand to really uh, produce that nice clean fermentation but also get it finished relatively quickly under that pressure. So that was the recipe, but what about the finished product? So everything went pretty much to plan with the brew day. The final beer came out a little bit stronger on the ABV, so I calculated it as 5.3%. Uh, I was putting that down to a little bit of an efficiency boost that I got, possibly down to the malts that I was using. So uh, the base malt was something that I don't normally have in stock, and that seemed to give me a little bit of a bump. Uh, in the brew house efficiency. The yeast also attenuated at a point lower than expected, so between the higher original gravity and the slightly lower final gravity, we ended up with that higher ABV. You could, of course, bump up the grain bill or scale the recipe if you want to match that, but I don't think it will make a huge amount of difference either way, to be honest. So as for the beer, as you can see, it's got some great clarity on it. As much as I love hazy beers, I think there is something really rewarding about getting a beer like this that has got fantastic hop aroma and presence on it, but also has that kind of crystal clear uh, clarity. Uh, I think that can come across in the, the kind of crispness of the flavor that you get from it as well. Uh, it's got a nice thick kind of foamy head on it, which sticks around reasonably well too. Um, and yeah, just looks really nice in the glass. Did take a little while to get to this level of clarity uh, Bry 97 does flocculate well, but it will still take a little bit of time when you've got a decent amount of dry hop in there. So on the aroma, there is that definite kind of like gooseberry, grapey kind of Nelson, musky kind of Nelson flavor there, uh, or aroma even, but still with the American kind of citrus grapefruit kind of rind. A little bit of malt sweetness, but not a huge amount. It's mainly the malts there. So it's, yeah, definitely a combination of, well, lots of things really. There's, there is some tropical, there is some citrus, there's grape, there's gooseberry. It's not overwhelmingly pungent, but it's got a little bit of everything in there. Yeah, very nice uh, aroma on it, flavor wise. Definitely crisp, definitely dry, decent whack of bitterness in there. And then you get this kind of bit of grapefruit, kind of tangy citrus flavor. There's some tropical notes there. So I think you get a little bit of maybe some mango, slightly tart kind of gooseberry, grapey flavors. Yeah, very similar to the aroma. You're kind of getting quite a few different notes there, but nothing really kind of overpowering the others. It's a nice blend of flavors on it. Um, good kind of body and mouthfeel, even though it is quite crisp and dry. It's still quite satisfying on the mouthfeel front. Yeah, it's a lovely beer. The reason I'm drinking out of a bottle is because the, the keg disappeared quite a while ago, and that's pretty much all I've got left is a couple of bottles of this. So it's worth a rebrew. did well in the competition. And uh, yeah, if you fancy having a go at something like this, I'd say it's a decent recipe to uh, to try out. So if you do give it a go, let me know how you get on. And uh, if you've got any thoughts or tips or pointers on brewing beers of this style, 
then let me know in the comments. Cheers, everyone. I'm the dude. So that's what you call me, you know? Uh, that or uh, his dudeness or uh, duder or, uh, you know, El Duderino if you're not into the whole brevity thing.